Welcome back. In today's episode, we have the conclusion of the interview with Keith Michael Felder. In business, have you ever sent an email or had a conversation and really just kind of regret it, what you just said? Well, we've got some great tips for you in today's episode. Welcome to this edition of Peak Peak Performers Performers Podcast Podcast. with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to become become a peak peak performer performer in any area area of of your your life life or business. Thor Conklin here. We give you the tricks, the tips, the tools, the strategy, the technology, and the psychology peak performers use in order to get more done and execute at the highest level. If you know what to do but struggle with getting it all done or simply want to raise your game to the next level, this podcast is for you. Sit back and enjoy. Most of us have had mentors growing up. Did you have one? I've had a number, but... Is I, there one that kind of sticks out? There were, I, yeah, you know, it's funny. I thought you were going to ask me these questions similar to this. And there are two that are very specific and very important to me. My mother and my grandmother are huge influences in my life. Um, and that code of rules that I have speaks back to both of them. And I'll, t- I'll tell you why. I'll start with my grandmother. My grandmother uh, was born in 1930, so she's born into the Depression. Um, she's very bright, and, but she married early, like every, every, good, ca- every good Italian woman in, in Brooklyn was supposed to do. But my grandmother could have done anything on her own. My grandmother was extremely bright. She was on a road to be a bookkeeper, which was you know huge post-World War II. I mean, that's like being the CEO of Avon for a woman you know, in, in that time. She, my grandfather was a very flawed, deeply flawed man, and uh, he made some unforgivable mistakes. So my grandmother was left with her her children, uh, being towards the end of adult children, a ton of debt, um, a big lean against their beautiful home on Long Island, and uh, a working resume that looked like in 1950 she was a bookkeeper, and here it is, you know, early 1980s. Um, what she was able to do off of that, my grandmother, when she passed, was still a working woman at 82 years old. She was able to raise those children correctly, provide them a home, get out of that debt credit crisis that my grandfather had put her in, have impeccable credit, and leave a legacy and leave an estate to the four children, which is really pretty remarkable given her layoff. And she did it through sacrifice, and she did it through working through her own set of rules. And I'm toying with the idea of re- writing a book, uh, which be it's tentatively called it's tentatively called five in- five life ideas I learned from my Italian grandma without the wooden spoon. <laughs> uh, so she's really important in my life. <clears throat> my mother had something very similar happen. My dad passed. My mom was very very bright. Uh, she still is. My mom is a uh, high school uh, administrator now, teacher, and it's her third career that she's on. She holds several advanced degrees now. But my uh, dad passed in a tragic uh, drunk driving accident when I was six, and my mom wasn't working at that time, and she had a real tough time digesting that, and she didn't have a college education at that time, and I watched her go without. She had me, and that's it. It was me and my, me and my mother. And I was six, so I really couldn't contribute too much to the uh, financial stability of the household. I watched her go without. I watched her sacrifice. I watched her sacrifice for the longer term good, which is something you learned alluded to earlier. And as it gets colder out, I'll never forget this kind of stuff. My mom didn't own a winter coat. And this is New York from the age from when I was six years old to when I was 10 years old because she had to sacrifice for me and she was sacrificing to put herself back through school. Uh, by the time I was 11, my mom was a homeowner at 29 years old. Um, she had already been back in school for two years and was working full time and had several coats. So, so those are important life lessons to walk away for. And that, that idea of sacrifice and deferred compensation work. When I do a financial plan for somebody or we do an investment strategy, that idea of saving for the longer term or saving so you have an exponentially better life is something I try to get across to that, that, that client in my practice. That, that's great advice. You know, I always recommend to all my clients that they spend 100% of what they take in. And I'm going to be specific about this. I want you to listen to what I mean by this. Make sure that your money's going somewhere and that it's quote unquote spent. Now, a big portion of that needs to be spent into your investment fund. Investing in things that have the ability to one day be worth more. That's not a car. You buy a car, 
it's going to do what? Depreciate. You buy a meal, it's gone in 24 hours. Make sure that you're spending money in your investment area so that money's just not sitting around. I literally take it and I put it into a separate account. So when I get paid, money, certain percentage, goes into that account and it's done. It's already, quote unquote, spent. So make sure that you're spending your money in areas that are going to return potentially investment to you in the future. Yeah, and that doesn't have to just necessarily be monetary. I mean, that can be self-enrichment. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, look. Says the financial advisor. (laughs) No, I mean, no, look. I mean, look. If your psychology is not where it needs to be, invest in yourself. I invest myself every single year. You know, I want to point something out about what you said about uh, Tony Robbins. A lot of people on this show know Tony, uh, uh, drink his Kool-Aid or, you know, they're Tony lovers. You've never been to one of his programs. You've never heard him speak other than probably the internet. And you're definitely not a quote unquote Tony fan uh, or part of his fan club. So it's interesting that you said that his investment book, Money, was made an impact on you. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, if I think it's one of the books that you need to own um, as, a, as an entrepreneur. I think you need to own that one. I think you need to own Think and Grow Rich. I think you yeah. need to own some of the Ogmandino books. This is an important one because this one's practical. It's, it's, it gives really good, pra- strong, practical advice, and it strips away, again, one of the, the C's that I'm, I keep talking about, cost. It strips away the cost, too, yeah. which, is, which is important. Yeah. And, and he spoke to, what, 50 of the, the richest, uh, most admired investors in the world? Was, it, was that the number? Yeah. Was, I believe it was 50. Um, I'm to three quarters through the book right now. Yeah. Uh, and, and it would cost you, what, 29 bucks? So for 29 bucks, you can find out what the 50 of the greatest uh, investors in the world think. I downloaded it to my Kindle for $8. Yeah. I mean, you know. But see, here's the, here's the funny thing is, people aren't going to invest $8 to learn what people that probably have a net worth of a, over a trillion have to say. I, I can't afford $8. If you can't afford $8 to buy a book, we've got an issue. That same person was likely buying, spending $8 to buy a shot of Jameson. Too, Absolutely. You know, so. All right, here's a question that my team just asked me a couple days ago. They're like, you never ask people this, this question. I'm like, no, I don't. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, what is the worst email that you ever sent? One I haven't thought about. And I'll explain what I mean by that. No, I'm very serious. Um, two things. When people write an email, this is important. Uh, if you write an email in business, you know what a lawyer calls that? Evidence? Exhibit A. Exactly. <laughs> Exhibit A. Exactly. So when you're writing an email, whether you're writing it to uh, a friend, uh, a girlfriend, a colleague, a business, take an, if, if, if anything that's emotionally charged, take an hour and think about it. Do not hit that send button right away. So the worst emails I've ever sent are the ones I haven't thought through. Yeah, yeah. We just did a podcast on the difference between re- uh, reacting and responding. And on first you know, blush, it's like, well, what's the difference between responding and reacting? Big difference. Reacting is boom. Response is hmm. I'll tell you what I do. I, have an, I do have a, what do you call it, standard? I have a rule for it, but you, you call it a standard. <laughs> My standard, yeah. I have a standard for it because we all, we all get a little hot under the collar. And uh, I've had a recent run-in with a vendor who I just think is just completely wrong. And this is on the construction side of my business. And he is. But what I did was when I wanted to respond in an emotional fashion, and I do this a lot, I'll send the text to myself first. Send a text to yourself? Yeah, I'll vent it first. I will send the... I never tried to send a text to myself. I'll send the, the Hagar the horrible text or email to... I'll, I'll text the email to myself or I'll email it to my text account. Oh, okay. I'll send yeah, the yeah. one that looks like, you know, when in the comic strip when Hagar the horrible would... And the, you know, the, this, all the signs. Yeah. Um, you know that I'm a poet when it comes to swearing. I've definitely kept it yes. toned down here. Yes. So I can really string together... A, a bunch of curse words that would sound like, uh, like poetry. When I feel that way, and I know that's going to happen, and we can't, we're not perfect all the time. When I feel that way, send it to yourself first. And then wait an hour or wait a day, and then look at it and say, is that really how I want to be represented? That is a great bit of advice. I love that. I'm going to use that. Stolen. Second thing I'm going to steal from you, too. <laughs> You're looking at like five to ten years right now. <laughs> No, you, did you re- read the uh, waiver on the show? <laughs> I didn't sign anything. Everything you say is now mine. <laughs> if you were flat broke tomorrow, what would you do? Yeah, invest in yourself. Uh, don't give up on 
Don't give up on, if you have a business or you have a dream, continue to work out that dream even when you're flat broke. I think being flat broke sometimes is an advantage for a yeah. small business owner. Yeah, you're hungry. Yeah, you're, you're hungry and you're going to learn a lot. Yeah. Um, when you have money, uh, P.T. Barnum said it best, the fool and his money are easily part, most easily parted, correct? Um, when you don't have money, you tend to make better, better choices, better economic choices because you don't have a choice. And that boils down to going into the Publix and actually looking at what things cost and dividing it by count. You'll learn those lessons and hopefully they'll stay with you and become rules. So becoming flat broke is empowering. I would grew up flat broke. I mean, my, when, I, when I tell that story about my mother, uh, that's, that's how a, a good portion of my life was, was not in, uh, not in the upper middle class. Um, it was in a working, very working class environment. And the fool and his money are easily parted, but working class and, their money, and people and their money are even more easily parted for, for a variety of reasons. Um, it teaches you to stay disciplined. It teaches you the cost of a dollar. Uh, so being, I think being flat broke wouldn't stop, shouldn't stop anybody from moving forward. As a matter of fact, if you're more than flat broke, if you're negative, I'm not advising you to do that. There is something empowering in that. So continue to work towards how you're going to get out of that hole and how you're going to build. Keep creating your strategy and working within it, uh, your personal strategy. Great advice. You know, you and I are not young kids, and I see Speak so for yourself, old man. <laughs> I am older than you. <laughs> but, you know, I see so many people running around in their early 20s spouting uh, advice about this, advice about that. And, you know, I take that with a little grain of salt. I think it's great for what they've accomplished. I, I really do admire many of them for what they've been able to accomplish. But one thing that comes with age, and that's experience. And that experience sometimes comes from bad choices. So if you had to do it over again... Are there some lessons that you learned along the way that you wish you maybe learned a little bit earlier in the process? Yeah. Um, I think about this a lot because as, as I think about my grandmother and as I think about uh, potentially writing that book, there are some lessons that she taught me that I separated from. I would have, I would have been a better, better little saver in my uh, late 20s and mid-30s. Uh, because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what you're going to want to do. And uh, when I talk to you clients, I say, you know, be prepared because life happens. You know, it's very easy today when I'm watching the Jets invariably get killed again. I will see a commercial for a very large investment retirement <laughs> house that has a green line and just follow the green line and everything will be okay. What happens, unfortunately, is when people get knocked off that green line, they don't know how to get back on. They beat themselves up. So I would have been a better little saver because that was one of my grandmother's. And when I say little saver, that's her little quote unquote words. In my 20s, in my late, in my uh, 20s and, and mid 30s, uh, I will say this about millennials um, from crotchy old men like like you and I. We often give them, we look at them sometimes with a, a side eye. Um, I've had the opportunity through a networking group to meet like five or six just remarkable millennials. And one thing that they are really good at is they're really good at identifying where costs are. They're not easily duped. They're not easily hoodwinked yeah. um, by, by marketing. And I, I, I admire that about them. So that, that's the, the advice I'd give myself would be a little bit more like them, that, that I wouldn't get hoodwinked and be a good saver. And don't be afraid if you get knocked off your plan, it's okay. Yeah, just get back on. Yeah, I, I mentor a group of uh, millennials, and I'm telling you, these 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 guys and women are amazing, amazing individuals. One of the women that I use for uh, my estate as my estate attorney, okay, uh, she's she's thirty thirty one, and she's knockout brilliant, and she does the estate planning on the side. She's got a law firm here in town that I'll give her a quick plug called Patton Law, but she does uh, what is that Patton P A T T O N Law. She does the estate planning for a number of our, our clients, the, uh, the legal part of it. She doesn't actually do the investment part, let's be clear. Uh, but she also advises startup companies here in Atlanta. And some of, the, some of the ideas and some of the business plans that she's shown me are so far advanced to the tech business plans that I was looking at when I was, you know, back in 2003, 2004. So it's really remarkable what they're, what they're accomplishing and what millennials are accomplishing and how heady they are and how uh, market savvy they are. Not only the stock market, but the overall consumer market. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. All right, so this is going to be a question I have not asked any of my guests up to this point. 
But the other day, I was just sitting. How are you so good looking? Well, <laughs> well we thank all, you, we sir. We all know the answer to that. It's uh, the genes from your grandma. <laughs> uh, no, I realized that really in life, we're all looking for happiness, success, wealth, to be healthy, and to be wise. So I thought, well, if we're all looking for those things, why don't I just ask my guests, what's the secret to being happy, successful, wealthy, healthy, or wise? It's an interesting question. I'm going to tell you that you're not the first person to come up with that idea. Uh, a friend of mine, she's a nurse practitioner, and she sees people who are married more than 15 years, she asks them, what's the secret? Yeah. That's a derivative yeah, of yeah. this. Um, well, and that's what the whole show is based on, asking questions that kind of lead you to a set of standards or rules or, or questions that can get you to this. But I'm like, instead of just asking questions that are related, why don't I just ask my guest the question? What's the secret? This might sound hokey, but what is that person's definition of all five of those goals? Very, and, and I don't believe that hokey to be, I think that's absolutely the first question you have to ask because happiness to me is not going to be happiness to you. And it, and it, and it does, uh, it evolves over time. It does. Um, I have a close friend of mine from college. Uh, we were housemates a million years ago in college in uh, 1997 at Allegheny College. And uh, two vastly different people, okay? Um, you know, he was, uh, you know, he's he basically he's a hippie. You know, that's the only way I could really put it down. So uh, a couple of years, a couple of months after graduating, about a month after graduating, Phil, his name's Phil, he walked the Appalachian Trail. Um, and he, he completed here at, at Stone Mountain, but he walked from Maine down to Stone Mar Mountain. And he decided his next act was going to enter the Peace Corps, and he went to uh, Mauritania. And before he left for Mauritania, uh, I got a chance to get up with him, and I was just about to start my career uh, at a firm in, in New York uh, on Wall Street as a rep. And I'm like, wow, you just walked you just walked from Maine to Georgia. This is such a foreign concept to me at 20, 21 years old. And now you're going to Africa to dig wells? You're crazy. And he said to me, you just studied for a test for eight weeks, didn't leave your, didn't leave your apartment, and now you're going to work in a concrete jungle. You're crazy. So it really depends on what your, what your perspective yeah. is and what's important. So. so first find out what's important to you, then design a plan around that and go do it. But yeah, that fits for everything. What's, gonna, what's going to make you happy? What's going to make you rich? Rich is not, doesn't necessarily have to be commas in a bank account. No, nope. rich, rich can be how you are. It took me a while to realize that too. I mean, I, I left a job to move down here. I was making uh, an inordinate amount of money, um, but I wasn't happy. Right. I wasn't. Oh, that happens all the time. I wasn't rich. Yeah. I, was, I, was, I was devoid and poor. Yeah. Money's not going to make, uh, make you happy. So, Keith, uh, share with the peak performers how they can get a hold of you if they have any questions and uh, email, website, okay. et cetera. Yeah, I hope your uh, your listeners have a pen if they're going to jot down my email. My uh, And it'll my, be in the show notes as well. Okay, yeah. My last name is uh, incredibly long. It's 12 letters. So, uh, my email address is letter K, like Keith, M-I-C-H-E-L, F like Frank, E-L, D like David, E-R, at Forte, F-O-R-T-E, capitalgroup.com. You can also visit our website at fortecapitalgroup.com. Uh, we'll be opening our doors officially on Monday. We're very excited about that. So uh, tomorrow we'll be into our Forte Capital Southeast. We have a location that's uh, located on 80, uh, 80 Broad Street right now in New York in the financial district. And we'll be hopefully expanding throughout the, uh, throughout the country over the course of the next uh, upcoming years. I appreciate it, Keith. Great, oh, man, great fun. job. Are you truly living your potential? Are you getting the results that you need, want, and desire? There was a time in my life where I was not, and I needed answers. For the last 16 years, I've been obsessed with the question of why some people achieve massive results and others do not. And I found out that it comes down to one thing, execution and the ability to take your ideas and plans and dreams and turn them into reality. That led me to the question, what are peak performers doing that others are not doing? How do they think? How do they act? What is behind the science of execution? I have now uncovered the secrets to the science of execution, and I want to share them with you. I have an intensive three-day event called the Business Execution Summit. If you are truly committed to taking your game to the next level and mastering the science of execution, the most important skill that you will ever acquire Simply take your phone and text the word 
B-E Summit. One word to 41411, and I'll send you out some additional information on our upcoming event. Thank you so much for listening today. I really do appreciate your time, and I hope you found today's show valuable. If you would like to receive these shows automatically to your phone or to your computer, simply go to iTunes and subscribe. After listening to several of the shows, if you're so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating as this helps us reach additional people and spread the message. If you're truly committed to taking your life to the next level and doing whatever it takes to become a peak performer, but something's holding you back, something is blocking your way, and you just can't seem to figure out what it is, send me an email to info at thorconklin.com and I'd be more than happy to get on the phone with you. We'll schedule a 15-minute discovery call. No obligation, no cost. I absolutely love to hear from the listeners. And if there's something I can do to help, I'd be more than happy to do that. Also, if you found something of great interest in today's show and you want to share that with your friends and family, simply go to my Facebook page, Thor Conklin. Click on the episode, hit the share button, and share it on your page. You can follow me at Twitter at Thor Conklin. The website is ThorConklin.com. We're constantly adding new free resources discussing additional tricks, tips, tools, and strategies on how to be a peak performer. Remember, I try to keep these episodes short so you can listen to them during dot time, doing other things, commuting, driving, walking, working out. Decide to be a peak performer in all that you do. And until tomorrow, have an absolutely amazing day.